So I want to read the, you know, the, the next section here. But before that, I want to quickly mention the scriptural precedent for this, because, you know, this is one of these things that I often get into conversations about for those that aren't from a Lutheran tradition who say, well, humans can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. So what do you mean that, you know, in a Lutheran service, at the very beginning of our, our divine service, we have a corporate confession. So the church comes together and confesses sins together. We've sinned, uh, thought, word, and deed, by what we've done, by what we've done, done all, all that kind of stuff. And then we have the pastor saying, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's that I forgive you that really wigs people out. <laughs> like, you can't forgive my sins. Who are you? Let's look at what scripture says. And there are a few places we can go. So let's start with um, the Gospel of, of Matthew. Now, Matthew chapter 16 is where we first see this idea of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. This becomes a really key text for the papacy. And the Roman church continues to cite Matthew 16 in terms of the office of the papacy. I'm not going to get into that debate here as we move on in the Augsburg Confession. We can talk about that, but I'm not going to spend time on that right now. Let's see. Um, what I want to do is just read verse uh, 19 here. So we're not going to deal with the, the Peter stuff and the relationship between Peter. We, we can save that for another time. But he says this, Jesus says this to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So we see here that to Peter is given something. Like this this exists. <laughs> like this, this statement exists in scripture. And the verse does not say, uh, you have the ability to remind people that they can confess to God and they're forgiven. Like it doesn't say that. Now that that's not true, but there's something more going on than just that. This is not just Jesus commanding Peter to, you know, remind people of the gospel or tell them Jesus died for your sins. He's saying you, Peter, you have these keys and you actually can exercise them, which means you can forgive sins and you can bind sins. So you can say your sins are not forgiven and you can say your sins are forgiven. Now, there is a connection here between what Peter is told he can do and what happens in heaven. So the binding on earth, binding of sins, the non-forgiveness of sins, is connected to a non-forgiving of sins in heaven. And the loosing of sins is connected to the loosing of sins in heaven. So what happens in the heavenly courtroom is connected to what happens on earth. They are not separate things. Now, the linguistic construction here is a bit complicated in Greek. Um, it, it can be translated as whatever sins you've you know, if you lose sins, th those will have been forgiven. You know, there, there's kind of this, this weird construction there. But I don't want to get into the specifics of that because I don't think that it ultimately changes the primary point here. That what is going on on earth is connected to what's going on in heaven. And not just in a way that the earthly thing is just a mentioning of something that happens elsewhere. Like what's going on in heaven is the thing that's going on on earth. Okay, so there's this connection between heaven and earth in terms of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't think we can take that because of that construction too. I think that does help a little bit to explain some, some more of how that works. It's not, you know, an absolute thing. Of course, if the church says your sins aren't forgiven and you've repented and the church is wrong, it's not like God's like, oh, well, <laughs> sorry. Like I, I would have forgiven you. I know you repented, but you know, your, your pastor said no. So, you know, obviously it doesn't work that way. So, so we're not going to be strict about it in that, in that way. You don't want to go that, um, that far with it. But pretty clearly there is some kind of authority to forgive sins that is given to Peter. Now, is that just given to Peter? Right? That, that's the question. Is this just given to Peter? Is this part of, um, you know, is this, yeah, is, is this part of, his office as as pope well as we get into then two chapters later um in in matthew chapter 18 let's see he says i'm looking verse 15 here if your brother jesus says if your brother sins against you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone if he listens to you you have gained your brother but if he does not listen 
Take one or two others along with you, that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, so this is part of the role of the church to call people to repentance and specific repentance, right? So this is saying the church can call you to specific repentance to, for, and demand that you confess your sins. Um, then let him be to you as a Gentile tax collector, which means then you, you've bound their sins. Like you're, you're treating them as an unbeliever. Truly I say to you, and then he says the same thing, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound, or again, it could be translated shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he goes on, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my father in heaven. So we have, again, this connection between earth and heaven. They're, they're, they're connected. So you ask on earth and God in heaven does it. Then for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And so he's speaking specifically about the church. This is the, the keys are given here, not just to Peter, but to the church. There is the gathering of the church. There is the expectation that if there is sin, yeah, it's confronted between brothers, but at some point it comes to the church. Then the church can bind or loose sins. So the church has the authority to forgive sins, and in forgiving sins, it does that which is true in heaven. So then we have a, another text. So this doesn't just happen once. You know, we've got Matthew 16, uh, which is given to Peter. Peter, of course, being the chief of the apostles, there's a reason why it happens first to Peter. That doesn't mean he's he was the first pope, but but clearly Peter has a leadership position. So he's representative of all of the apostles, which is why it's then given to the church, as in all of the apostles. And then in John 20, um, we have what I think is honestly probably the, the clearest text on, on this entire issue. Let's see. Jesus says, and this is, uh, first of all, this is after this is after the resurrection. Um, Mary Magdalene had seen Jesus. The, the, Jesus had just now come in to see the disciples. Uh, even though the doors were shut and locked. And Jesus says in verse 19 of John 20, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad and saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even I send you. He's sending them to start the church. You know, this is just before Pentecost. He's saying, I'm sending you. The Spirit is guiding the church. This is the very foundation of the apostolic church this is really really key because these are i mean these are the, the last words that jesus gives you know in in john's gospel now okay there is literally he speaks to thomas after this but among the last words like this is this is some of jesus's final instructions when he is giving them these instructions about how the church is to function then he says when he said this he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit is first given. Jesus breathes, the Spirit is given to the apostles. Now they have the Spirit. They have the Spirit. And, and that's the kind of beginning of what then occurs at Pentecost. He's saying, now we're, we're moving into the, the age of the church. He's breathed the Spirit on them. And the first thing he says they can do, because now they have the Holy Spirit, they are the first leaders of the church. Then he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. There is no ambiguity in that text. And he doesn't say, if you tell them about forgiveness, he says, you forgive. Like, you forgive. You. You apostles. So this is why, in a Lutheran context, we can say, I forgive you. The pastor can say, I forgive you. Because the pastor is the one who is called to exercise the office of the keys and do exactly what Jesus commanded, which is to forgive sins. And if people aren't repentant, to bind sins and bring them to repentance. Um, so both of those, that, that's an intimate part of what the calling of, of the church is. So this is why the Augsburg Confession, you know, the, the Lutheran reformers aren't saying like, I'll throw out this whole confession and absolution thing. No, it had its root in scripture. Like there's a reason why the church started doing it. The fathers were right in doing this. Their sins should be confessed. But when it became this kind of legalistic, you better confess every single sin or else, that was the problem, and that was really a break from what what was the apostolic tradition. That's what that's what I'm arguing anyway. That's not consistent with the apostolic tradition here. So they're saying this is good. Private confession is good. Public confession. We have a confession of a general confession of sins in the worship service. There's a general proclamation of forgiveness. 
sometimes it's really good to get specific too, um, especially if it's like a really serious sin or if it's something that's burdening your conscience. It's good to just be in a regular practice of confessing your sins um, to a pastor because they are called to exercise the office of the keys. They don't exercise the office of the keys because they are better than somebody else. There's no special power in them. It's merely an issue of office. God has chosen to use them in that office. He's called them to that office. So that's part of what they do. The keys don't belong to the pastor. The keys don't belong to the Pope. They belong to, well, Christ, but he's given them to the church. The pastor is simply the one that exercises the office of the keys in the church. Okay.